Ty, um, I've never introduced a guest this way uh, before, um, but I am so glad that you exist. Well, thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really nice, really nice way to start off. <laughs> I, I am this person that you study and write about. I am and have always been awkward. Huh. Um, m- my girlfriend would make fun of me, but lovingly, that when we would go, she always admired that we would go to a party, for example. We were at a social event. And I had no idea how to insert myself into a conversation. You know how some people can just sidle up to a conversation and just join in. And it's not awkward or weird or anything. And I'd never known how to do that. And so what I do is I stand in the middle of the room or to the side, but sometimes in the middle, completely by myself, holding my drink, just watching everybody. And weirdly, I'm totally comfortable doing it. But my God, it's awkward for everybody else. And it's awkward for me, too. But, But I've just gotten used to it. I know exactly. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about, Simon. So you're you're in good company today. How? What was your? What's your journey? How did you start studying awkwardness? Well, I, I guess real life experience. If we if we go all the way back, so uh, I was a super awkward kid, um, and I, I mean I'm still awkward now. Kind of recovered awkward. Uh, or well coped, awkward, I guess. But yeah, but yeah. Is. Gosh, if you knew me when I was a kid, especially a junior high is awkward for everybody. Of course, for me, it was particularly a difficult and and bewildering. Probably, like you said, a little bit awkward for other people as well. So yeah, that's kind of where it all began. Was just was just with life. And then I had some friends who had moved to new cities. It just so happened at, at this point in time. This was like 2014, I think. A lot of my friends who had moved just happened to be socially awkward <laughs> as well. And one of the things I like to do is go visit people when they're new to a city. It's always a hard thing to do. And uh, I'd go visit these friends and I'd watch them at parties or at bars or whatever else. I'd stand there holding a drink <laughs> sometimes on the side or in the middle. And they would start talking to somebody new. And it would just be heartbreaking um, because they'd be awkward. And the other person would excuse themselves politely. I got to go get a drink or I got to go do something they really didn't have to do. And I got to say, it just really broke my heart because yeah. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm sad for my friend who, you know, these were all really great people who were super interesting, tremendous character. And I thought it's, it's really tough to watch them struggle socially. But then I thought it's too bad for the other person too. Because they made a two or three minute decision on whether they wanted to be interested in this person or not. And now they're missing out on one of the most interesting people they could possibly become friends with. So that was where it all started, was just this this kind of pain for um, this empathic pain for my friends. Uh, But then also thinking, gosh, why aren't other people more understanding of where the awkward person is coming from? And it kind of led to this this question for me. It solidified in this way. I thought, you know, maybe if socially awkward people could skip the first five minutes of conversation, yeah, they'd actually be all right. Yes. Uh, because it's the small talk and the minutia that they really yes. struggle with. I, it, 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 yes, yes, yes. I struggle with small talk. I sm- struggle with minutia. It's a, it's a, you know, my w- dating for, for years, dating was awful because I didn't know how to, like, the, the awkwardness at the beginning. And then oh, I find yeah. myself overcompensating, you know? What, what's the correlation between extroversion, introversion, and awkwardness, or is there none? You're just either, you know, awkward and shy or awkward and outgoing. Mm. Like, is it just, you know... Yeah, well, that turns awkward? out to be, you know, very interesting, Simon, because there is a small correlation between um, awkwardness and introversion, which I kind of think would fit most people's stereotype or, or assumption. Uh, but it's it's not as strong as you would think it would be. And in fact, yeah. you do have on the opposite end, people who are really awkward and super extroverted. Uh-huh. So one of the ways I like to think about awkwardness is it's just never in the middle of the bell curve. You're uh, in this case, you know, pretty shy and and really introverted, or it could be that you're really extroverted, but maybe 
that kind of uncontrolled extroversion where you're, you're a little too much and overwhelming for other other folks yeah. if you don't moderate it. This is, I think this is interesting. I've always liked Susan Cain's definition of introversion and extroversion, which is about energy, mm-hmm. you know? Like uh, introverts lose energy being social and extroverts gain energy being social. Uh, you know, put another way, an, an introvert wakes up in the morning with five coins and every social interaction they have, they spend a coin and by the end they're depleted. And an extrovert wakes up with no coins. Every social interaction they have, they get a coin. By the end, they feel rich. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, and 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 to your point, it's not about social awkwardness. There are socially awkward introverts and socially unawkward introverts, and there are yeah. socially awkward extroverts and socially unawkward extroverts. So yes. what I, I what I appreciate is that you're defining this new category that's not about energy or or social or uh, 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 introversion or extroversion, but this new thing called awkwardness. So the people who aren't awkward, (laughs) (laughs) what, what what should we be studying in them? Like, is there Mm. this innate or is there a skill that they have that even may, even though it may not be innate for me that I can actually practice it and, and get better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So these non-awkward folks, I like to call them socially fluent. (laughs) <laughs> because oh, sure, sometimes yeah. I think about awkwardness, you know, if someone's not awkward, it's kind of hard to explain what's going on in your mind, <laughs> you know? And I say, it's, it's kind of like trying to speak in your second language. Um, it's just harder to decipher what's going on. Uh, there's that clumsiness. And then also when it comes to conveying to other people uh, what you're trying to get across, you just kind of have to th- think about the details more and it's just more arduous. And sometimes it doesn't come out quite right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I think about uh, folks who are not awkward as, as socially fluent. And yes, uh, awkward folks can learn a, tr- a tremendous amount. And, you know, one so of the secrets, I, I think. Get, I may not get fluent, but I can be somewhat conversational. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And you could even fool people, right? So you're, you're proficient, let's say, but uh, you catch people in the right situation on the right day. And they're like, hey, you're, you're doing great. Uh, so, so for example... I mean, I'm sure you get this all the time. If you tell people that you're that you're awkward, uh, people might have seen your public facing side and that's all they know about you. Yeah. And then there's almost this disbelief, like, Simon, you're not you're not awkward. You're like, no, I, I actually really am at, at my core. But when it comes to, say, something like public speaking, you learned the skills and you honed them to such a degree that it would actually be hard for people to know that you're that you're awkward. And I have to say, you know, when people say, oh, Simon, how can you be socially awkward? You stand on the stage, blah, blah, blah. But what they forget is that when I get off the stage, first of all, when I'm on the stage, I'm not talking to anybody. You know, I'm not interacting, you know. Right. Uh, but when I when I come off the stage, people do all the talking at me. Oh, I love what you said. That was great. And I just stand there saying thank you or as, answering questions. But But I'm actually not having to come up with anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know? that's right so it, it, it actually is actually quite it makes my life actually a lot easier weirdly you know yeah, As my yeah I, I totally progressed. get that my social awkwardness has been mitigated um, absolutely you know and you have you have quite a bit of control in that scenario right the public speaking you can actually prepare uh, for that and have some control over that uh, when it comes to people asking you questions you'll get new ones that you haven't heard before but you know your material, and so you're the kind of the subject matter expert. The That's the way it goes for observing socially fluent people. Um, I always tell socially fluent folks, awkward people are watching you, <laughs> you know, and hopefully yeah. it's not in a creepy kind of way. Yeah. But I know certainly when I was a kid, I would observe people I respected for their social skill and how they interacted with others yeah. and would just study how they greeted people, how they, how they responded, how they held their posture. Yeah. And then in a privacy of my own home, you know, would practice, actually practice some of these things so I could try to gain some of that skill. What, what were some of the things that you practiced that you, that, that, so you could gain those skills? What are some of the specific things that you practice? Yeah. Um, so a lot of things. W- one thing was personal space. My default, Simon, is to stand too far away from people. Uh-huh. So in the United States, it's about 18, 19 inches of personal space is, is just about right. I'd stand about 24 inches away, which makes you feel oddly distant <laughs> and it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I would watch even how close people stood to other folks. Yeah. Um, I would watch, I have a hard time with eye contact yeah. um, by nature. 
and I would watch how long do they make eye contact when they look away uh, so they're not, you know, bearing into somebody's soul all the time. Where yeah. do they look to? How long do they look away? And I would kind of get that rhythm from from social learning and then practice it. And, you know, it's a little awkward as you're acquiring the skills, but right. I guess it worked to a certain extent. I mean, it's kind of like riding a bicycle, right? There's hyper awareness to start. You're like, keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep pedaling. And then at some point it become you, you just it becomes more natural. So, you know, yeah. when, as you're practicing these skills, there's hyper awareness, which in itself is awkward for you, like counting, counting how many seconds you're staring at someone's <laughs> eyes. Yeah. But but to your point, so how long is is the what's the range of appropriateness? Because I catch myself sometimes like having a conversation with somebody and I realize I'm looking everywhere except at them. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's 3.1 seconds for the record. <laughs> 3.1 on, uh, second off. You can look wherever you want, it turns out. Uh, so but yeah, that's that's about 3. the right one amount. On, one off. 3.1 on, one off. <laughs> that's right. I tell <laughs> awkward people tend to love details. So I say, don't fuss about the point one. Right. But uh, yeah, about, about three to one uh, r- ratio. And it's interesting what you say about finding yourself looking anywhere but the person's eyes, there's actually some research on this where they can track, do eye tracking studies and actually watch where people are looking when they're looking into somebody's, uh, looking at somebody's face. And one of, the th- one of the things they find with socially awkward people is that compared to socially fluent people who reflexively look at the eye region, mm-hmm. uh, because the eyes contain actually the most social information, mm-hmm. awkward people reflexively look to the chin or to the ear, which have much less uh, social information. But what it seems to do is it makes the social interaction less overwhelming, less emotionally overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a way to kind of bring down the intensity of the interaction for the awkward person. Yeah. Uh, so, by the way, just a, a quick aside, I can't help but realize that for some people listening to this, this is an extremely awkward conversation. <laughs> that's, 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 that's right i feel like we're on the same wavelength here if someone's not on that wavelength <laughs> they we've just be uh we've lost do this for got, research they're, purposes they're, yeah they're listening to something else <laughs> they, they yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is for all the awkward people <laughs> that's right <laughs> well we can do a demographic study uh, as to what our list you know we'll see how many people listen to the episode and we can make an unscientific assessment of how many awkward people are because they stuck with it <laughs> Um, uh, so here's a, here's an interesting question, which is why are people awkward? You know, because the, the theory being that, you know, you know, I mean, I'm going to m- m- completely make stuff up here, but, you know, in, in the realm of evolution, you know, you, you want the, the stronger person, the, the smarter person to be the one who's procreating and the social person, the, the, the socially fluent person is more likely to be sort of have an alpha status and, and, and sort of get the better mate. And, and so the two socially fluent people will procreate and like make, it's got to be good for evolution to be social. For social animals, <laughs> sure. being socially fluent has got to be helpful. So, you know, how, how, how did awkward people survive evolution? <laughs> like why, why, so, are we, why are we awkward? Why is there yeah. awkwardness? It's kind of a miracle we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I think that's a really interesting lens through which to look at the awkwardness and where it comes from, right? And along with your um, with your hypothesis, I think it's really interesting that awkwardness shows pretty strong heritability. So in boys, for example, it's about 53% heritable and girls, about 39% heritable. So there is a significant genetic component there, which uh-huh. suggests it's being passed down, right, right, uh, right. Through, through generations. Um, one of the, it's, it's not really clear uh, yet, it's, it's not a slam dunk why awkward people would have uh, not been selected out at some point. But <laughs> one thought is this, is that there's this curious and strong correlation between social awkwardness and what researchers call extraordinary achievement or striking talent. Uh, so, you know, people who achieve amazing things in this world, things that are kind of at the tail end of the bell curve, uh, they're actually more likely to be awkward. And the reason for that, you might say, well, maybe awkward people are more intelligent. This actually doesn't seem to be what accounts for this extraordinary achievement. Uh Uh, Instead, what it is, 
is this obsessive interest in things. And so awkward people have this tendency. I, I say awkward people really love what they love, <laughs> right? <laughs> and to the point that they get obsessed with it, they become obsessed with the details and the minutia yeah. and then trying to put those pieces together in different ways. Yeah. Uh, as an example, I, I heard a, a great anecdote from a, a friend of mine uh, from his wife. And she, she said, hey, uh, hey, uh, I have a little anecdote for you. Your buddy, uh, who's awkward, uh, one day I walked in and he had taken apart the toaster. And it was just laying there in pieces on the counter. And I said, what, what are you doing? Is it broken? And he just said, no, I was just really interested in how, in how the pieces worked and, and, and how this thing operates as a whole. And that's kind of like the awkward person when they really love something, they'll just really get into it and obsess about it. But that, that obsessiveness then translates into persisting through um, kind of hard times and challenges. And then also eventually getting to a point where they can achieve something that's really, uh, really pretty exceptional. That's so interesting. So, so I mean, <clears throat> so the the thought here then is, you know, when I ask why evolutionarily would would an awkward person, you know, even even make it, uh, it's because there are huge advantages. It's not it's not a it's not a it's not just social that there are huge advantages that we need the awkward people in our society because of their obsession and and they're I assume that they're also they're the observers. So yeah, the awkward person can be super valuable uh, because they are seeing the world in a different kind of way and they are seeing it in this more bottom up kind of way. And what happens then is you might put those pieces together in a way that nobody else would. And that can lead to creativity or or innovation. And that gives uh, diversity to a group's thinking, but can also then, of course, right, we're talking about evolution, add resources because they'll see new ways or better ways to, to do things. Yeah. This is so interesting, and and, uh, and 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 it also explains the the self-flagellation and the insecurity that sometimes come from being awkward is because we are equally hyper focused on ourselves, and because we actually have a means of comparison, right? Like I've been watching other people, and I know how they conduct themselves, and I'm not conducting myself that way. I've observed the socially fluent, and I'm being socially unfluent. Um. Uh. And I'm aware of that. And that, I think, is the source of the, unfortunately, a self <laughs> even more awkwardness. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Trying to overcome the previously awkward thing sometimes leads to even a more awkward situation. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the other thing is, and we, I think it's worth parsing out, which is <clears throat> there's no correlation, or I'm assuming there's no correlation between socially awkward and insecure. Yes, you're exactly right. So th- there doesn't have to be a yeah. correlation between um, your self-esteem and, and you being socially awkward. And if, yeah, if you just have an, some self-awareness about it and you're just kind of, stra- people kind of appreciate the straightforwardness. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, that actually took a little extra confidence to <laughs> come in hot with, hey, I'm an awkward person. And I think people kind of, I hot, think people kind of cool. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but you know, there are folks who it, it takes a while sometimes, and so, yeah. like with teenagers, for example, um, they might have a bit of a lower self esteem, and it's kind of understandable because they are struggling more. And this, in some instances, like the awkward kids getting picked on or something, which which doesn't yeah. help. But yeah, the ideal Simon would be to get to where you're at, to where yeah, you just have good self awareness and you own it. Oh, that's a great that's a great question, which is which is all little kids have no awkwardness. Like <laughs> little kids have n- no inhibitions, no awkwardness. They see the world through r- the rosiest color lenses, you know? And then adolescence sets in and all the awkwardness shows up. We look mm-hmm. awkward, we sound awkward, we act awkward, you know? And then for some of us the awkwardness remains at higher levels and for some of us it it dilutes and dissipates. The question I have is, is why do we get awkward in adolescence at all? Like if we weren't awkward as little kids, why the transition into awkwardness where there's more awkwardness amongst adolescent kids than, than, than not? There's a couple things there, you know, so awkward moments are just deviations from relatively minor social expectations. 
Uh-huh. Um, because if it's, if it's a violation of a major expectation, like trust, for example, then you're in a different realm of emotional reaction to right. that. Um, an unzip zipper that's, or spinach awesome. in your front teeth, not a big deal, really, right? right? But, uh, but those are certainly awkward kinds of moments. What happens when you get to adolescence is things obviously, obviously start to change very quickly. Uh, so that could be physical kind of stuff, but also mentally you get this surge of abstract reasoning and you're interested in popularity and abstract things like that. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these new expectations. Uh, all of a sudden I got to be fashionable. Mm -hmm. Um, all of a sudden I'm much shorter than everybody else who's going through their growth spurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's all these things where the, there's a gap between expectations and your ability to meet those social expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why in junior high school, for example, it just feels awkward for a lot of folks. I'm loving this. So what I love about this, which is it's awkwardness you're defining, and I love this definition, which is it's 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 not quite meeting a social expectation, mm-hmm. right? And so I'll tell you a strategy that I've learned that has been extremely beneficial to me, right? Um, because to your point, in a social interaction, in a bar, at a party, at all these things, there's a there's a there's an expectation of sociability and some degree of social fluency that an awkward person really struggles with the small talk, the, all of that stuff, w- which I do. And so one strategy is to really, 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 really work hard on your social fluency so you can be good in those environments. The strategy that I've adopted is to avoid those environments, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which yeah. is I go into, you know, but your point about meeting social expectations, which is I go into environments where the social expectations are different, right? Hmm. So, so an, uh, an environment where there's a small group of people a dinner table with two or three people has a different social expectation than than a than a party or a bar or a, a social event, you know. Yeah. And you can sit quietly at a table for quite much longer without being viewed as awkward, or you can interact now and then, as an or or, or allow somebody else to carry the conversation without being awkward. So, I, what I really like is understanding what the expectations are. I think we should all work harder to be better versions of ourselves and be prepared for all scenarios, of course, but there's something to be said for not beating yourself up when you're bad in a place where the expectations are one. You can change where the expectations are and put yourself in a place where you're just going to be naturally better. Yes. Yeah. Oh, love that. (laughs) Love that point. Love that strategy because um, some of the unhelpful advice I hear folks give to awkward people is, well, just put yourself out there. You know, just go to the party, just go to the club, go, go to the nightmare scenario where you're not going to do well, basically. Yeah. And what you're saying is, hey, I'm going to try to set myself up for success yeah. by putting myself in social environments where where I can thrive and it's better suited to my preferences and and my skills. So, yeah, I absolutely, absolutely love that. I mean, one of the things I've just observed in our so- short interaction here is like you're a naturally curious person. And in a smaller group setting with one or two people, and that would be the kind of trait that would really thrive because you'd be, yeah, hey, tell me more uh, about this thing that you're thinking about or that you're interested in, which is really the key to a great social interaction, period. Right. Right. And so, yeah, by, by you putting yourself in the ideal environment, that's really one of the best things you can do. I, I'm, gaming, I'm gaming the system. Yes. Yeah. 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 A- a- exactly. And you've been... You've, you've also given yourself permission to let go of, you know, kind of forcing yourself to be in situations that you don't enjoy or that, that aren't good for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if there's loud music and I can't actually have a conversation, I, I, I literally shut down. I can't yeah. do it. I'll yeah, walk yeah. into a place and if the music is too loud for me to engage with somebody, I will leave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because it's, it's uh, not going to go well. There's just, just nothing, there's just nothing I can do in this space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 No, no. I'm the same. Same and way. so these little shortcuts to like, you know, I can just walk into a space and if it's, if it's not too loud, even if it's a social environment, I'll figure it out. But if it's extremely yeah, yeah. loud, I'm gone. No, no. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it sounds like too, like you're interested in getting the other person talking, which is you know, one of the things I didn't say is <laughs> if the other person talks two thirds of the time, you talk one third of the time, 
they will always walk away thinking you're the coolest, nicest dude <laughs> around uh, because they got to talk about themselves and you were genuinely interested in what, what they had to say. So I think sometimes awkward people put the pressure on themselves to perform, but it's actually really getting the other person to perform, which sounds like your mindset in these in these interactions. When it works, sometimes I think I have to perform and that's when it falls flat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, sometimes you get two awkward people and the other awkward oh, person is that real super shy me. type. That's happened to me where I've seen in a social environment where there's lots of people, you know, party club, whatever. And there's one guy standing on the side. Like, I know he's struggling. I know he feels alone. I, I know he doesn't know what he's doing. And so I'd be like, all right, I'm going to I'm gonna try and sort of like throw this poor, poor guy, a lifeline. I've been there and I'll walk up and be, and I, and again, cause I'm complete crap at small talk. I'll walk up and be like, hi, how you doing? You know, yeah. you okay? And yeah. he'll go, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. And then the two of us stand there in complete silence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And awkward, Looking out the dance awkward, floor. You know, awkward plus awkward is really awkward. <laughs> yeah. And we're both feeling it until one of us goes, okay. And just walks away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, oh yeah and i know been the on the receiving end of that and i've sometimes been on the giving end of that but an awkward person will struggle to rescue an, aw an awkward person <laughs> yeah now you're both drowning <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, not a good, it's not a good scenario <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right so so now we've 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 talked about what what we awkward's can learn from socially fluent people and how we can uh, better improve for, for all the good reasons, you know, it's helpful to be socially fluent in a, in a social world. Um, uh, what about, what can socially fluent people learn from awkward people? One of the things I think for folks to know in general is that socially awkward people are just as kind. They are just as trustworthy. They are, they have all, you know, all the stuff that actually really matters in a close relationship. Uh, awkward people have. And I, I think one of the things that's bonus is that awkward people a lot of times have an empathy for what it's like to be misunderstood, or they have an empathy for what it's like to to struggle mm -hmm. in an interpersonal situation. And one of the things I, I just really warms my heart, I guess, is to see the awkward person you know, notice somebody who's struggling, whereas the socially fluent person might not because they're, you know, not paying attention to some of the details. And um, one of the things I love is, you know, the awkward person taking the time uh, to really help folks along who, who might be struggling. And so I think one of the things socially fluent people can learn from awkward folks is to slow down sometimes and think about, hey, is everyone doing well here? And what can I do to be helpful? I think one of the other things that awkward people do well, that socially fluent people oftentimes can learn something from is just their determination and their persistence. And, you know, I, I love to, when I'm talking to an awkward person and I find that thing that they're passionate about and that they're obsessed about, yeah. I just love hearing about their passion for it, but I also love hearing how they work on it. Yeah. And there's this discipline um, that can sometimes tip into rigidity, but uh, there's this discipline and there's there's this persistence, uh, especially through difficult parts, mm -hmm. that I think is really admirable. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Uh, can you tell me a specific story about something you were involved in over the course of your professional career, you know, a project you were involved in, something like that? It doesn't matter if it was commercially successful or however you want to define that, um, but something that you absolutely loved being a part of that if you could if every one of your projects or any, every one of your research, you know, projects was like this one thing, you'd be the happiest person alive. Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. I, I guess I haven't, I guess I haven't really thought about that much. I, I think, uh, you know, I had a recent experience, I guess I was, uh, I was working with a psychedelic pharmaceutical company <laughs> and, uh, they were, um, they wanted to build this technology tool to understand why psych psychedelics seem to work for things like depression or addiction and, and other things. And one of the things I loved about that, that environment is uh, the guy I worked with most closely was the chief technology officer. And 
he was one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. And he would, he only wanted to meet every two weeks, which I liked. <laughs> and he'd always start with the same question, which just exemplifies what I think I enjoyed about the situation. He would always say, Hey, Ty, what can I do to remove the barriers to let you do your best possible work? And that was really all he was interested in, in doing. Mm -hmm. And I think the times I've really loved whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's something about social awkwardness or a uh, technology tool or whatever it might be, is yeah. I just love the problem. You yeah. know, I, I just love a big, nasty problem. And I, I love obsessing <laughs> then about figuring out the details of that and, you know, trying to come up with something uh, that's maybe creative or, or different. And I think finding the freedom to do that in this modern age is, is pretty hard to do. Yeah. What's give me an early specific happy childhood memory. Not like we went to my grandparents every weekend. That's something, something specific I can relive with you. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was pretty lucky. You know, I had a pretty happy, pr pretty happy childhood. Um, I, I think, I guess the thing that comes to mind right now that that was actually kind of a big deal was I was in California with, with my dad. We were just kind of taking a boys trip, uh, the, the two of us. Mm -hmm. And my aunt had very generously given me $50, mm -hmm. um, which was really nice for her. She said, Hey, just, just spend this on, on whatever you want sometime. And I said, okay. So, uh, my dad loved clothes. <laughs> so we, we went out, did a lot of clothes shopping and there was this 19, this 80s style rainbow jacket that I loved. It had the stripe down the middle. It was kind of this parka. And um, it was like $45. And um, my dad expected to pay for it. It was like school clothes shopping or whatever. And uh, I was I actually took it when he wasn't looking. Uh, he was looking at something else. I went and I paid for it with my with the money my aunt had given me mm -hmm. and when my dad kind of saw what i'd done he just started crying he like broke down in tears mm -hmm. <laughs> like oh, did i did i did something awkward like i had upset him or something like that and uh he just said I'm, I'm so proud of you for you know just wanting to uh, be fair and, and do your part and that's the most important thing in life ty is just that it's not about the money it's just that you know, you're, you're thoughtful about, um, being fair with people and, and being generous with people as much as you're able. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and my dad was kind of a man of few words. So I remember that really meant, it really meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was also kind of, you know, at the time, I think I was in fifth grade starting to feel like, Hey, maybe I can do, be my own person and do some things on my own. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting about that story, but also all of your work, which is, um, you really care about self-reliance and giving people the tools to be self-reliant. And in, 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 as you, as a kid, it was the $50 that gave you self-reliance to make a decision to get something you wanted. Right. And your awkwardness work, you know, which is to give people the tools that they don't have to lean on someone or rely on someone, but that, that, that they know enough and they understand the strengths of being awkward, that they can, that they can actually thrive in life without having to be something that they're not. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. You know, and I just yeah. love that you have this and you said it's 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 a very generous way of going through life. And it and it, and it's like in in all of your work, you have kind of become that CTO at the psychedelics company, you know, which is what can I give to you so that you can be your most successful? And oh. that's exactly what your and oh. that's exactly what your relationship work is that is exactly what your awkwardness work is what can i give to you so that you can be your most successful you know oh, i want to, I, and i love that i love that I, about you i really appreciate that that's uh, one of the nicest things i've heard in quite some time so uh i'll, t I'll try not to get emotional <laughs> uh here but that's that's really nice to that's, that's really nice to hear and yeah if i can do that for folks i'd gosh that would um i i, I think for me at least, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Ty, I, um, you know, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your research, sharing your work, sharing your magic. Um, I, 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 I in, in a very awkward way, I have to say this is very cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I've really enjoyed yeah. the conversation as well. And uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, I think uh, we can get on the same wavelength pretty easy. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Simon. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.